Hello, everybody. This is Seth from World of Paleoanthropology here, and today my guest is Jerry De Silva, and I'm going to let him discuss or introduce himself. But here he is. Oh, hi, Seth. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to talk with you today. Um, like you said, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Jerry De Silva, uh, Jeremy De Silva. I go by by Jerry with friends and family, uh, and I'm a paleoanthropologist at Dartmouth College. Uh, I study mostly the origins and evolution of, of upright walking in our in our hominin ancestors. That is awesome. And I love how, um, you know, a lot of our guests, it's fun sometimes to see where specifically they specialize. Like we have people that, you know, are very general and it's fun to hear from them. And then hearing from people such as yourself that are so specific on like, bipedal upright walking and you like I know I can ask you pretty much anything about that specifically and you'll be able to answer it for me and I think that is something that is just unique and very cool to specialists um how did that become your favorite or your most interested topic yeah that's, that's a great question there's a short answer there's a long answer um <laughs> I uh uh you know, even as a kid, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Um, I was always interested in, in, in bugs and animals and planets and galaxies and you, you name it. Um, and even through college, I, I studied, you know, astrophysics and, and animal physiology. Um, I never took a biological anthropology course, though, in, in college. Um, it was something that I discovered uh, after college when I started working at the Boston Museum of Science. And um, we had a small exhibit on human biology and an even smaller section on human evolution. Um, and we had a beautiful cast of the lietoli footprints, but they were down with our dinosaurs. And I thought, well, that, that's not the greatest place to put them. That might spread a misconception that human ancestors and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, like what you find in those, those um, sometimes those uh, uh, bags of, of children's toys, right? With mixed up <laughs> yes. animals of the past. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you know, Neanderthals and mammoths and T-Rex. Um, yeah. I said, well, you know, let's not do that. So uh, I, I pushed for moving those lightly footprints up to the human biology exhibit. And my boss, uh, whose name is Lucy Kirshner, she's one of the greatest science educators I've, I've ever met. Um, she said, look, if you, you know, I'm all for this, but um, go learn everything you can about human evolution. Because um, I really didn't know anything. Um, except, you know, that humans evolved, right? You know, I knew there were fossils <laughs> and that we were related to apes and, you know, I, di I didn't really understand it very well. Uh, so I went to the, to the library. We had a museum library at the time and uh, I started reading books by Ian Tattersall. Uh, mm -hmm. And I saw that you had Ian Tattersall on um, with an interview recently. And I, I read through that and just it warmed my heart because he was so influential um, yeah. and, and you know, in inspiring my, my love of paleoanthropology. And, and it was, you know, it was because I would read through his books and it, it wasn't just the narrative of human evolution, it was that every one of these fossils told this amazing story, right? And every fossil had this extraordinary amount of information that could be, that could be squeezed from it if you, if you knew just how to ask the right question. And I was hooked. Um, so I started grad school with Laura McClatchy, uh, who studies uh, locomotor evolution in early Miocene apes. Um, and in doing so, I, I had an opportunity to study chimpanzees in, in Western Uganda. Um, and I, I was fascinated by how they were using their feet and ankles when they climbed. Um, mm. And so I got very interested in climbing uh, adaptations in the living apes. And it, it, you know, it's not a huge leap from there to, to get really interested in uh, bipedal evolution. So I started thinking about the trade-offs between climbing and walking in Australopithecus. Um, and then, you know, down the rabbit hole you go and, and I just right, right. With, with upright walking. Well, that is awesome. Um, I definitely see, you know, that path there. And I, I think you explained that wonderfully um, in I think this is actually, I was planning on talking about this a little later, but it's a great segue into your latest book, because you talked about this um, almost specifically as you just described it. In the first few chapters of your new book, 
How Upright Walking Made Us Human, which comes out on April 6th in the United States. And um, I'm not very far into it because I just finished another book you were working on. Um, now, was that, was the book about Darwin your idea or how did that come about? Yeah, so um, the, the, the book about Darwin, uh, A Most Interesting Problem, um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of anniversaries. I, I love, you know, like this year is going to be the 100th anniversary of the first discovery of a human fossil in Africa. The, the Cobwee mm. skull was discovered in 1921. So uh, I think it's in June that we're going to be at the 100th anniversary of knowing about fossil humans in Africa. And that to me is su super cool. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, the reason is because it's an opportunity to reflect, right? On, right. on where, 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 how far have we come in that time? And, and what, what do we not know? Uh, what are the next sort of steps? What are the next hundred years going to look like, say? And so um, uh, in looking at the, you know, the calendar and, 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 and thinking about um, influential, you know, books that have been written, uh, yeah, I recognize that we're coming up on the 150th anniversary of Darwin's Descent of Man um in in 2021 and this was a few years ago this is 2018 probably uh and i reached out to allison collette an editor at the princeton university press um and picture this idea that look um uh, this is something i love to do with students where i love to have them read uh chapters from from darwin um and then read a primary journal article from last year and to see like you know this is what he was thinking at the time but this is what we know now and there are gonna be places where he got things right and places where he got things wrong. And that's okay. That's how science is supposed to operate. Um, we're supposed to challenge the ideas of our great thinkers. Um, and, and sometimes they're gonna be right and sometimes they're gonna be wrong. Um, and they'd be the first ones to be thrilled by new evidence showing that they were actually off on, on, on something that their hypothesis uh, uh, was, was incorrect, uh, usually because of uh, the, the lack of evidence that they would have had at the time. So um, with that in mind, um, I started brainstorming uh, you know, colleagues who have written eloquently about human evolution, um, who not only have sort of a scientific expertise in the different areas that Darwin addressed in Descent of Man, um, but, but knew how to communicate it to the general public. Um, because Darwin did that. Darwin wrote these books. These books are, are readable. Um, Darwin wrote for a, a general audience. Um, and so it was fitting that, that we did the same. Uh, so I was able to, to um, convince 12 of my or 11 of my colleagues uh, to join me on this, on this project. And, and each individual uh, took a particular chapter. So Alice Roberts, for instance, um, took the chapter laying out comparative anatomy and embryology, which is really all the evidence Darwin had at the time. There weren't fossils or very many fossils. And certainly he didn't know about molecular genetics. Um, Janet Brown, the great historian wrote our introduction. Johannes Haile Selassie uh, addressed the, the, the human fossil record chapter, which again, Darwin was just speculating because we didn't have anything. Um, and he was long dead by the time fossils in Africa were discovered. And, and now with Johannes, it was, okay, here's one of the best paleoanthropologists in the world, <laughs> finding these extraordinary fossils able to update us um, on where we are now uh, in, in, our, in our study of human evolution. Um, so it was, it was, it was quite a, a, um, you know, a, a, an enjoyable and, and entirely fulfilling project to, to dive into. I learned so much um, reading the chapters from, from my colleagues. Um, I, I was just, you know, really grateful uh, that they um, saw the vision I had for this book and then, and then saw it through. Well, I have to definitely thank you for envisioning this book because I have to highly recommend it and I will link it in the description of this video, but it was such a fun read. I mean, getting, hearing from so many different people and then on their expertise and you know what they know was just amazing. And the topics that were covered from raising Darwin up to you know being this great scientist who was a man, you know, 
ahead of his time to he was very wrong about certain things and we need to realize you know times have changed and i think this book does an amazing job of not making him you know like the god-like figure of anthropology but just a normal scientist and i think the book does an amazing job of that so if you're interested in darwin or biology especially human evolution this book is definitely something you should check out yeah now, there's you know yeah. th- sorry to just jump in so that that there there as you said um there is a lot of hero worship that goes on with darwin and mm-hmm. and i get it um you know i went to downhouse a couple of years ago and walked the thinking path and and it was an emotional experience for me you know here here's Here's a, you know, visiting a place, visiting the study, visiting where this man um, who had an enormous impact on how we think of our place in the living world and how we got to be the way we are today. And there are thousands of us now, thousands of scientists who are, um, you know, like you said, we're specialists, we're diving deep into these questions of evolution um, that really, you know, the ball got rolling. It was already rolling a little bit, but he gave it a good shove. And, and, you know, we, we owe a lot to that, that man's uh, curiosity about the world and his, and, his, and, and, and his wonder, right, of why is the world the way it is? And, and yet, hero worship in science is not healthy. Um, it causes us to embrace ideas, even if the evidence uh, works against them. And so it is our responsibility as scientists um, to challenge the ideas of these great thinkers and to say, wait a minute, how do we know this? Are we sure we're right about this? And with Darwin, the two areas where he was the most wrong uh, were around race and sex, sex differences and, and, and racial categorization of, of humans. And Augustine Fuentes and Holly Dunsworth wrote those chapters in this book, and they are masterpieces. Um, They're absolutely exceptional chapters in the book. Um, and, and I can't recommend them, them more to, to, to your readers. They just, uh, you know, they take my breath away when I, when I read them. They absolutely nailed, um, uh, y- you know, treating, okay, Darwin, a man of his time, but yes, he's a man of his time, but think how much he box about all sorts of other things. And yet he couldn't think outside the box when it came to sex differences in race. And that shows you the power of bias. And that we we have these biases, and we have to recognize them as as scientists. Science is objective a way as we've ever come up with thinking about uh, of understanding our world, and we should be congratulated for that. But it is not free of bias, and pretending it is uh, does a great disservice to, um, uh, to 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 you know what we think we know about our world. That's a very strong, good point that you make. And I think a lot of people who, because my audience is very, um, they, you know, they range from people who barely heard of anthropology or evolution to armchair anthropologists who just never went to school. Mm -hmm. So I have a wide range of people. And I think it is very important to drive home that idea of how important it is to not have bias in science. Because if you don't have that ability to step out of yourself and look at it from a different angle, that's where mistakes are made. And then we get lost and go down paths like eugenics and things like that. And we end up, well, we end up in places we don't want to talk about. Yeah. But, and look, you know, data, data never speak for themselves, right? Data have to be interpreted by people. And so who are those people? doing those interpretations who are those people that are generating hypotheses you know science is a lot more creative than i think people realize um that that hypotheses don't just spring into being they they are developed in brains of individuals who have had a lived experience and if those hypotheses are only being generated by a small um homogeneous group of the population historically it's been white men that have been our scientists um, then we are limiting ourselves in terms of the possible explanations for why the world is the way it is. And so not only is it the right thing to do to have more voices, but it, it's going to help us understand our world better. 
that we're going to have um, uh, uh, you know, at, at, when, when there are, there's more representation of science in, in science, um, we're going to have uh, a, a, a wider swath of hypotheses to test. Um, and some of those are going to end up being right. And, and in many ways, it's going to open up possibilities for uh, testing ideas that uh, we just can't do if we are, are simply a a, a bunch of white guys doing doing science, which is again historically how it's been, and that's changing, but um, not fast enough. No, definitely not. Although I am glad to see, um, just since I have started reporting on the news and whatnot, many more, like for instance, South African voices speaking up and yeah. other um, people of color starting to really get involved. So I think that's a great thing. And we're def they are definitely having new ideas and things that we hadn't thought of before. And I think that's a great thing that we have going on. Absolutely. Now, to change topics just a little bit. So you just came out with that book. That was only a few months ago, unless mm -hmm. I'm mistaken. And as I mentioned earlier, on April 6th, you have your own book coming out. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? And mm -hmm. you know, I've you've been kind enough to allow me early access. I've been reading it a little bit, and I gotta say, I'm very excited for what is in the future of this book. So why don't you tell us a bit about it? <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Um, right. So uh, uh, first steps: uh, How Upright Walking Made Us Human uh, is, is the book I've been working on for the last couple of years, um, and it not only is a is a accumulation of the research that I've done on the origins and evolution of upright walking. Uh, but in researching this book, um, it was so much fun to visit the labs of uh, a lot of my colleagues um, and to really step outside my comfort zone and um, uh, you know, visit folks who are studying locomotion in say uh, dinosaurs, because um, mm -hmm. many dinosaurs were bipedal. So I had an opportunity to talk to the paleontologist Lindsay Zano uh, about not only bipedal dinosaurs, but uh, there, there were once um, bipedal crocodiles. So bipedalism right. is something that um, we see in other lineages, uh, the, you know, reptile lineages, we see it in birds, there uh, are, are, you know, fossil footprints of ancient lizards moving on, on, on two legs. Um, it, but in mammals, it, amongst mammals, it's incredibly unusual to see bipedal gait. Um, it's practiced most frequently by primates. You'll see, you know, chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans occasionally moving on two legs. Bears will do it occasionally. Um, but when they do it, we freak out. We pull out our phones, we take video of it, um, uh, you know, post it to YouTube, you get millions of hits. Uh, there, you know, there was a gorilla a couple of years ago in the Philadelphia Zoo named Lewis. And mm. Lewis um, would occasionally walk on, on, on two legs. And he did it because um, we think um, he, he loved tomatoes and the curator would put uh, uh, tomatoes around his, his exhibit. And he learned the hard way that if you knuckle walk with a tomato in your hands, it, it squishes. And he'd get very upset that, that the, his tomato squished. Um, and so he started um, carrying them gently in his arms as he moved on two legs. And a visitor to the zoo filmed this put it on YouTube, and it was on the NBC Nightly News. Now people <laughs> freaked out uh, uh, by people. So what I realized was that, okay, humans walk around every day, right? You, you just, you know, most humans, uh, able-bodied humans are able to navigate their world on two legs, and we never think about it. And with other animals do it, we, we, we just, you know, uh, uh, scream with delight and, and, and videotape it and and, and, it may, and it's newsworthy. So what's going on here, right? There's a, there's a story here. Um, and of course, from the fossil record, there's an extraordinary story of um, upright walking being the, the defining characteristic of our lineage that as far back as you go uh, in the hominid lineage, there's evidence for at least some form of terrestrial walking. And then as I dove into the fossil record more and more in my career, what I found was that 
uh, there was never at any one point just one way to walk. Different species of hominins looked like they had evolved different gates, different experiments in, in upright walking. Um, and I found that absolutely uh, fascinating. And, and then of course the, 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 the possibility, this is something we're still trying to work out and the field is pretty divided on this, but the possibility that we didn't evolve from a knuckle walking ancestor that the common ancestor may have been something more upright to begin with, moving bipedally in the trees, and that knuckle walking might actually be a derived uh, locomotion. And so, you know, most of the public uh, thinks of human evolution as the, the chimp slowly turning into the human, right? Mm -hmm. The thing you see on bumper stickers and t-shirts and coffee cups. Um, and it, that, might, that might be way off. And so in this book, I wanted to explore all of um, the, the recent fossils that have forced us to sort of think differently about the evolution uh, origins and evolution of, of upright walking. And then in the second part of the book, I dive a little deeper into what it means for, for our own lives. Um, and so I, 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 I write a lot about and learned a lot about um, how do kids learn how to walk? Um, and why does it happen around the age of, of 12 months or so? And how variable is that? And it turns out it's enormously variable uh, that different cultures around the world um, have, have, have different average onsets of walking. And it really doesn't make a huge difference uh, in terms of the, the adult gait. Um, of course, the modifications of the pelvis as a result of bipedal locomotion then complicates childbirth. And so I have a chapter on what's called the obstetrical dilemma. And that has become an incredibly hot topic in our field because it's much more complicated uh, than, than the simple narrative we've, we've come up with. Um, and, and then, you know, I dive deep into, into all of the musculoskeletal problems we develop as a result of, of upright walking, you know, foot problems, back problems, knee problems. We are a mess. So how in the world could, could this form of locomotion evolve given how poorly adapted we seem to be for it uh, right. in, in certain ways, in certain ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, the book, the book takes you on this, this, this great evolutionary journey um, and then really ties to, it tries to connect it to um, everyday lives today and why, why understanding the evolution of walking uh, it, it matters, to, should matter to, to people today. Well, that sounds like, I mean, I'm enjoying it. I know a lot of my readers and really anyone interested in paleoanthropology should be interested in this book because it really is such a key question. And as we know, and as you explain in the first few chapters is there's so many hypotheses out there for why we started walking upright and some of them I like I love the fact that in like chapter two or three or something you literally just made up a hypothesis and you're like well it's not as weird as some of the other ones so and that just cracks me up so much and um you know some of them are very valid some of them are very far out there and I just think the closer we get, the more questions we have, the more things, you know, appear in our line of sight that we need to answer. Um, one question that I have that just because I'm still pretty early into it, do you discuss Homo naledi's foot at all? I, I do, um, to, to, to some degree. Um, so, you know, one of the things I learned when I was when I was in grad school um, at the University of Michigan, uh, working with Laura McClatchy and and um, also you know influenced by by Milford Walpole and Bill Sanders, and mm -hmm. um, was that uh, you know once you, once you get to Homo erectus, you're pretty much human, and that from then on through the Pleistocene is just really the story of 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 you know, homo sapiens, essentially, and where you want to, you know, draw that line and, and have that cut off to say, okay, this is homo sapiens and that isn't, well, it's somewhat arbitrary, right? Because in an evolving lineage, um, where, you, where you put that boundary becomes somewhat, somewhat arbitrary. So, you know, I, I study Australopithecus. I'm really interested in 
um, the Pliocene. I'm interested in the late Miocene and what was going on then. But the Pleistocene never really excited me <laughs> because eh, you're pretty much human by then. Um, yeah, you got a few, you know, 100 cubic centimeters of brain still to grow, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're pretty much human. Okay. Um, boy, uh, has that story changed <laughs> the, last, the last 15 years, uh, last, yeah, well, really the last 10 years, um, yeah. the Pleistocene has gotten much busier and much more interesting uh, to me. Um, it wasn't just, you know, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Uh, you had the Denisovans, mm -hmm. you had the island uh, uh, Homo floresiensis and now Homo luzonensis, whatever that is. We're still trying to figure that thing out. <laughs> um, and but but you know a, as surprising as those fossils are, the most surprising to me still is Homo naledi, um, mainland Africa, uh, South Africa at a time when there are fossils like the Kabwe skull we mentioned earlier. It's been dated now to three hundred thousand years old. Um, evidence of Homo sapiens evolving in sort of the 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 uh, you know the oldest Homo sapiens fossils we have are in Morocco. Ethiopia and South Africa. And if you think of Africa as a giant triangle, those are the three corners. So Homo mm. sapiens is evolving, you know, pan-African, uh, not in one place, one time, it's happening across the continent, genes are being exchanged. Um, what in the world is a small brain, small bodied hominin with some primitive characteristics of the hip and of the foot and of the shoulder and of the arm and hand, what in the world is that thing doing in, in South Africa at a quarter of a million years ago? It is an absolutely fascinating discovery. And I, I think your listeners have heard about it before, mm -hmm. um, but when I started working on this material, um, I went down to South Africa in um, January of 2014 um, to begin working on it after it came out of the ground, after the, the underground astronauts had done that extraordinary work of retrieving all those fossils. And I was, you know, gripped to this and you know, watching the tweets and, 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 and communicating with, with the team uh, over, over email. Um, and I went down there in January to look at the material because um, I'm not any good to them retrieving this stuff. I'm, I'm much better sort of <laughs> after it's out of the ground, yeah. trying to analyze it. All right, what is this thing? And um, at the time it was, um, it was in a, in a in a separate vault in another building, um, and it was down in a in a in a, in a basement, um, and no windows, and it was almost like you know being in Las Vegas where you lose track of time and you know, no <laughs> clocks. And I was just focused on these fossils, and I emerged. I, I don't know how many hours I was down there, but I emerged after spending all this time with these fossils. And Lee Berger was there, and he said, "So what do you think?" And I said, Lee, it's a better Homo habilis than Homo habilis. Like, like this thing is, this is an ancestor of Homo erectus. Um, that this is, this, is an ama this is amazing. And I was seeing Australopithecus characters. I was seeing Homo characters. Um, to me, this is, you know, this is a 2 million year old hominin that is connecting us to Homo erectus. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm off, I'm wrong. Um, it was only a quarter of a million years old. Now, it still could be a relic, mm -hmm. it still could be a, you know, a, a, a population that is telling us what that thing looked like two million years ago uh, in some ways. Um, and so we're still trying to figure that out. Um, but what a fascinating combination of anatomies that I really never expected to see um, in, in, a, in a hominin of, of that time period. The foot of Homo naledi, which I do talk about a little bit in the book, is, is quite human-like. It's one of the most human-like parts of Homo naledi, um, but it has long curved toes, uh, which is unlike what we see in, in Homo erectus, and it has a flat arch. Um, at least that's how we've reconstructed it uh, up to this point. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to be wrong about that if, if folks you know, reanalyze the foot bones and, and show that we're wrong. But, from what we could tell, it's, it's pretty flat footed. And we've got lots of feet, it's not just the one foot. And they all look like they're flat footed. Um, and so you get a flat footed hominin with long curved toes. Um, but then most intriguing to me, and this is again, something we're still working on, is that the joints, the lower limb joints are tiny. They're not expanded. You don't have the big knees, the big uh, ankles, the big hips, that a biped, especially a, 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 a biped, 
um, living in the Pleistocene generally has. And the way I interpret that in the book is that um, Homo naledi likely did not have a large um, territory, a large home range, mm. that it wouldn't have been able to dissipate forces through its joints over a long distance. And so it would have had a small home range. Um, again, that's quite different from what we see in Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, uh, uh, in, in Homo heidelbergensis, if, if you recognize that, um, sort of a late Homo erectus, right? Um, that, that those things all have huge joints, they long legs, evidence for big territories, um, you know, and, and expanding beyond the, the borders of Africa into Eurasia. And uh, this thing looks different. Um, and where it, where it then fits into the family tree and who it's related to them and how it got to be that way and what its ancestors were and what they looked like. Oh, these are all just fascinating questions. So I pretty much ask all my guests this, and it's always fun to get an answer. Um, if you had to pick just one hominin as your favorite, what would it be? Seth, don't do this to me. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's cr that's a cruel question. Um, okay, I, I love it though. Uh, okay. So my favorite hominin is, is Australopithecus sediba. Um, okay. and, and there are multiple reasons for that, but one of them is um, that it changed my mind. And okay. I, I, love, I love having my mind changed. Um, I love thinking a certain way, and then somebody presents me with new evidence, and I'm like, huh, okay, uh, you know, that, that's cool. I, I wouldn't have thought that. Um, and, and and okay, maybe I was wrong about this other thing, or maybe I have to modify my, my views a little bit because of this new evidence. And Australopithecus sediba forced me to do that more than any hominin I've, I've, I've ever seen, even, even Homo naledi. Um, mm. And it was because I was just coming off my, my, um, my thesis. I just finished my dissertation um, on the foot and ankle of, of hominoids and hominins, uh, including Australopithecus. And I'd seen all the Australopithecus foot bones from South Africa and Eastern Africa. And to me, an Australopithecus was an Australopithecus. You know, that the, yeah, there was variation, sure, but it wasn't meaningful variation. It wasn't functionally relevant variation. Um, and that Australopithecus essentially walked like, like we do uh, with a few subtle differences, but subtle. Um, and I was in South Africa in 2009 um, and, and the way the story goes, and I talk about this in the book, I tell the story in the book that um, I was in the, the, the old vault room uh, at the medical school at the University of the Witzwatersrand, uh, where the fossils used to be kept. They're now kept in a, in a, in a different mm -hmm. vault uh, on the main campus. Uh, but so I was at the medical school and I was there with Zach Coffrin. Zach Coffrin is a paleoanthropologist now at Vassar. And uh, he studies jaw and, and, and brain development. And he had all these jaws laid out of, of you know, the Sturkfontein's Hortkrantz material. And I had all these foot bones and I was scanning the foot bones. And I was panicked because I was, this was my last day I was there. My flight was that night back home. And I was not done with my work yet. And I was making drawings of these fossils and measuring them and scanning them. And, and all of a sudden, Lee Berger burst into the room. And he had this crazed look on his face. And I had never met Lee before. I, I knew about him, but I'd never actually met him. Um, and he was looking around, looking around. He clearly wasn't looking for us. Um, you know, a couple of guys that, you know, one guy was in, was in grad school and I had just got my PhD, like, who are we, right? And he then locks eyes with us and he says, do you want to see something cool? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't have time. Like, no, <laughs> I, I, I've got to do my scans. I've got to make my drawings. And, uh, and Zach, you know, as Zach Coffer, and he, he's, yes, of course, I want to see something cool. And so um, again, Lee asked the question, he looked at me and he said, do you? And I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was going to go get a coffee anyway. You know, my scan had already started. I could, I could take a break. So I decided, okay, I can take a break. I'll, I'll go see something cool. He walks us down a hallway into a room and there's a table 
big table with a black cloth on it. And like a magician, he pulls the black cloth off the table Always and lying the there, man. yeah, and lying there are two Australopithecus skeletons. I, two Lucys, right? Like, what? <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought I would have you know, seen this in my entire career. And you've got these two Australopithecus skeletons lying there. Um, some of the material was still in Breccia, you know, sort of mm-hmm. pieced together, but oh my God. Um, and, I, you know, our, our field can be a little contentious. And so I, I took a step back and put my hands behind my back. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, just pick up fossils and have him get upset with me. And so I did this and he said, what are you doing? Dive in, tell me what you see, tell me what you think. And I love it, you know, here's this trust that he's putting in us. He wants to know what we think. So I go to the foot, Zach goes to the head and we start making observations. And there were things in that foot. I didn't like what I was seeing. I was was bothered by it, but they were still sort of in Breccia. So it was difficult to tell. Um, Okay, so now fast forward six months, they announced a new species, Australopithecus sediba. And about a week later, I get an email from Lee and from Bernard Zipfel, uh, who was a former podiatrist turned paleoanthropologist uh, in South Africa and became a good friend of mine. And they asked if I wanted to work on the, on the foot and leg of Australopithecus sediba. And look, I was in the right place at the right time. If, if I had said no you know, to Lee saying, do you wanna see something cool? There are enough people that work on feet and legs. He would have found someone else. Um, so being in the right place at the right time and then saying yes when he, when he said you want to see something cool <laughs> now gave me this opportunity to work on this material and back to my original point where I said you know I thought I knew what an Australopithecus foot looked like when I started working on this material it was shocking it didn't look like it was supposed to the heel was tiny it looked like a chimpanzee's heel parts of the ankle were human-like but parts were very primitive and looked more ape-like there was a morphology in the middle of the foot that looked more ape-like, and, and I mean more ape-like, not than you and I, more ape-like than Lucy, more ape-like than Australopithecus looks, and that shouldn't be, and yet here were the bones showing me that, <laughs> and not just from one individual, but from multiple individuals, and that was key to make sure that, you know, it wasn't just pathological, as we, we often right. will say, when a fossil doesn't look like it should, and that sent me down this wonderful journey of trying to figure out what was this thing doing? How is it walking? How is it moving? How do these pieces fit together? Because in isolation, each of each of the anatomies was they existed within a single individual. In the case of the the MH2, the adult female skeleton, uh, was what we uh, most of the material that we had to work with. Um, and so we ended up hypothesizing in 2013 that she was a she was a hyperpronator. And not only that, but her whole species, the whole species Australopithecus sediba would have been in part because they were still comfortable climbing in the trees. Um, there's so many aspects of their, their arms and their shoulder uh, and even, even the isotopes of their teeth that would indicate that they were more comfortable in the trees than say Lucy and her kind would have been. Um, and that was so exciting for again, a species a million years younger than Lucy to have this completely different combination of anatomies um, that you know you don't expect if you're thinking linearly. And that forced right. me again out of this linear view and really see that over the course of bipedal evolution, there were all these experiments that, that were going on, uh, you know, from the beginnings of bipedalism right up through right up through the Pleistocene. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, as you said, the Pleistocene has become very busy the last 10 years. Um, and so I started in anthropology in 2013, and right when Lee Berger announced Homo Naledi. And that's what got me hooked and started on everything. And then just looking back at just the last 10 years, and how some people today still call, I think it's um, the 70s, the golden age, or maybe when Lewis Leakey was alive, the golden age of paleoanthropology. I don't know, these, this last decade or the last few decades, I don't know. Um, Seth, I think you're spot on. I, I'm with you <laughs> that, that we are in a golden age of paleoanthropology. Um, 
and and it's you know to me it's this trifecta of uh, extraordinarily talented and committed researchers in the field finding these things that there's so mm -hmm. much more out there to find and I think about all the discoveries that Lee Berger has made, all the discoveries that Johannes Haile Selassie is making. Uh, Maeve Leakey has made incredible uh, discoveries in, uh, in, in Kenya. Um, I, you know, the number of fossils that have been, that have been unearthed in the last you know, few decades, is, uh, last 10 years, is, yeah. is unbelievable. Then you've got the, um, the molecular techniques, the extraction mm -hmm. of ancient DNA and now proteomics. That are allowing us to to ask questions. No, we were we were already asking these questions to allow to allow us to, to actually answer some of the questions uh, <laughs> that that we had about these old bones that we thought were unanswerable because we couldn't pull uh, uh, genetics out of them. We're, you know, res amazing researchers are are now solving those problems, and then you've got a whole bunch of, you know, a, a whole new generation of thinkers with fresh eyes on old fossils that are seeing things and interpreting the fossils in a new light. And I tell my students all the time, don't assume we have this figured out. Don't assume that if you see a little you know, bump on a bone that someone else has already seen that. Uh, we miss things all the time. One of my, one of my favorite examples of this is um, my graduate student, Ellie McNutt, who is now a, a, a faculty member at Ohio University. The first time she went to South Africa, she was looking at a calcaneus that I had looked at dozens of times, and so had a ton of other researchers. And she was making an observation on a chunk of bone on the calcaneus called the, the perineal trochlea, or the perineal tubercle. It's a bump that, that a couple of tendons run past. And she said, oh, well, that's a shame. It's too bad it was glued into the wrong place. And I said, no, 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 I think it's in the right place. You know, look again. And I mean, I could picture this bone in my mind right now and see that, you know, and she said, no, it's in the wrong place. And I said, ah, Ellie, come on, it, it, let me show you. And I went over, um, you know, think, thinking I knew what I was talking about, right? I've looked at this bone a lot and, and I, you know, like to think I know something about foot bones. And she was right. She was totally <laughs> right. And I had never, once she planted that seed in my mind, all of a sudden it snapped into view and it was, whoa, that's way off. It was glued in the wrong place. And not only that, but matrix had filled in the bone and had sort of exploded it. And so mm. it was artificially big. And mm. you know, people had on it and commenting on its size. That wasn't real anatomy. And again, you know, I like to think that I stare at these bones and study these bones and draw these bones and know these bones like they're members of my family. Um, and I, I missed that. And again, it, you know, it's because fresh eyes on these things are, are going to see things that previous researchers hadn't. Um, and that's good. That's a good thing. So, you know, all the time I tell the students, don't, don't assume we have this figured out. Um, you know, fresh eyes on Lucy, fresh eyes on Nariacotome, fresh eyes on all these fossils. Are gonna are gonna reveal new things about them. Definitely, and just curiously, um, what was it a calcaneus of? Well, <laughs> that's you know they they don't come with li labels, right? So it's it's hard to know. Oh, um, okay, yeah. The only uh, you know the the species that's been named um, at that site at that time is Australopithecus africanus. Okay, so, so it was a hominin. You know, it's basically oh, definitely, what I was yeah, 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 definitely, definitely a hominin. Um, but but Ron Clark has recently uh, uh, published on on Littlefoot and has declared it a different species, Australopithecus prometheus, right. and he thinks that at Starkfontein there are two species that are jumbled up there. Um, and oh, I'm a fence sitter on this one. I've jumped back and forth. Um, <laughs> there are bones in that assemblage that really bother me. Um, as a single species uh, in the foot. Uh, there are a couple of metatarsals, for instance, that just don't look anything alike. And it's not just normal variation either. These are two metatarsals that would operate differently in the foot and would cause mm. one foot to be more human-like and another foot to actually be much more apey. Um, and if that's the case, then you could have two things that are walking in very different ways 
uh, and using the trees in different ways on that landscape. Um, and so I do lean towards that interpretation that at Sterkfontein, you, you, you may very well have two different, two different hominins. Hmm. In which case, you know, what do you do with an isolated calcaneus? Could be either. Yeah, it could until be you either. Get, until you get a skeleton, until you get a template. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, just like with everything else in the field, more you get, the more questions that we have. Um, so, you know, I think that is an amazing place to leave this interview off.